Hi, everybody. Welcome to my show. <laughs> It's really great to be here.、Um, I hope that you have seen all my tweets on Twitter and you have seen my messages to you on Instagram, or hopefully you've come to、uh, visit my website. But it is、um, Older Americans Month in the month of May 2019, by the way.、Um, so, to celebrate the end of Older Americans Month, I wanted to talk about something fun. <laughs> and what's more fun than talking about sex, right? Right?、Um, you know, George Bernard Shaw, who, by the way, if you didn't know, was a pretty darn famous writer and playwright, said that we don't stop playing because we grow old, but we grow old because we stop playing. So let's never do that. And, and yes, it's worth talking about. And if you don't like talking about sex, then just listen. I'm good with that <laughs> for obvious reasons.、Um, By the way, please, if you like what you hear, subscribe and review. Apparently, I'm learning is the podcasting world、uh, circles around, revolves around this subscribing and reviewing thing. And so, if you like what you hear, please feel free to click on Yay, I like this and I want to subscribe. So, show us your support by subscribing and reviewing. We much appreciate it. I much appreciate it.、Um, And if you think you're young and this particular topic doesn't apply to you, think again. Making small changes early in life and being aware of what to expect really helps with the change, helps you stay a little more engaged in what happens when you get older. So, pretending something will never happen is not a solution. So, the more you know, the better prepared you are. That's my spiel for those of you who are younger who are thinking, meh, sex and getting older, why would I listen to that? So, this episode is really going to be a bit of a mishmash, or a better word would be a buffet <laughs> of various topics related to sexuality and aging. And that's on purpose since it's part one and really meant to be an overview to show you how huge this topic is. It probably could have its own podcast.、Hmm. But I will have parts two and possibly three if you are at all interested, with part two. Two being a conversation with a relationship and sex therapist who can talk a little bit more about this from that perspective. So stay tuned. That is going to be a fantastic conversation. So, you ready? Or are you making that face like, I want to, but I am too embarrassed, so stop it? <laughs>、um, thing is, sex is what unites us. Everyone has either wanted to do it, has done it, Or isn't doing it, but still is thinking about it. And if it's not sex, then it's definitely intimacy or being loved or being in a relationship. So stop it. <laughs> if you can't talk about it, you can't solve it. So let's just dig in. So let's start with、um, portrayals of sexuality in the media, of, of portrayals of older people's sexuality in the media. It seems like Sex is a thing for the young, you know, out there, except, except for the ever present Viagra advertisements. It seems to me that older people and sex suddenly became interesting when they had to start selling erectile dysfunction medications, right? <laughs> when Big Pharma decided, hey, we by accident have found this drug that works for erectile dysfunction. Let's sell it. <laughs> um, By the way, an interesting,、um, totally off topic tidbit about this is the majority of the men who use erectile dysfunction drugs are under 55, not over. And it's not because men over 55 don't have sex either, right? It's because erectile dysfunction is more prevalent and has more complex causes than everyone thinks. It's just a hard thing to admit to, right? But the truth is, it's a popular drug because pe despite people not always wanting to talk about sex or intimacy,、um, you know, sex actually happens more than you think, really. <laughs> Case in point, almost 8 billion humans on the planet. So it may seem that, you know, in terms of sexuality, as you get older, you know, you can no longer procreate, then what is sex for? But the thing is, Pleasure and 
the seeking of enjoyment is a strong part of who we are as a species. There is a reason we have all those nerve endings too, right? <laughs> I do think sexuality in older adults is a little more recognized these days and more embraced, you know, with movies like Book Club with Diane Keaton, which came out last year. Shows like Frankie and Grace, um, which star Jane Fonda and very funny, the very funny Lily Tomlin. Really great show if you haven't seen it yet. It really centers around the relationships of two women and two men of older age. And it's done in a funny, tasteful, irreverent way. Highly recommend it. Highly recommend it. But the blockbusters, you know, the big um, TV shows and films don't always get into that nitty gritty of intimacy as we get older, like smaller films do. So, you know, I'm a bit of a quote person. So um, an amazing quote, um, age is an abstraction, not a straight jacket. A great quote, right? It's from the 2012 Canadian film Still Mine, which isn't about sexuality per se, but it is definitely about the complexity of relationships as we get older and the power of understanding that love is love and how we respond to it doesn't change with age. It's also about how one man deals with his wife progressing dementia. And it's also about his own experience of aging and how he still stays true to himself as he gets older and is treated that way, right? It's it's really worth seeing. Same with a film called Clout Burst from 2011, which stars the beautiful Olympia Dukakis. And it's about two lesbian women who run away to Canada to get married you know, pick up a young, hot male hitchhiker along the way. It's funny and not funny at the same time and a really great film as well. They're both great and this is all you get because this is the extent of my movie critic skills. So (laughs) they're great films. If you haven't seen them, it's it's worth a look. There has been more of these films and TV shows lately, I do admit, and I think it's because the baby boomer generation has certainly made relationships and sex their own. I try to stay away from generational stereotypes, but, you know, to some degree, it really is a generation who expects just as much out of life as they approach their older years as they did when they were younger, and that definitely includes their intimate lives. There is an interesting poll, the National Aging Poll, that's done by the University of Michigan in conjunction with, I believe, the AARP. And they poll a whole bunch of people between the ages of 50 and 80 about different topics. But sexual health and intimacy is one of those topics. So that poll found when they asked that 76% of people between, again, the ages of 50 and 80 felt that sex was an important part of a healthy relationship, right? And over half of those people currently in relationships reported being sexually active. So out of that cohort of 50 to 80-year-olds, more than 50% of them were actually sexually active. Some other interesting stats, about two in three, so over 60%, described as being interested in sex, with 30% saying extremely or very interested, and 35% somewhat interested. Over half felt that sex was really important to their overall quality of life, with more men, about 70%, agreeing with that statement than women, about 40%. So I think that's the usual split with men women with questions like that. And not surprisingly, those with a romantic partner already were more likely than those without a partner to agree with that statement that sex was important. So after listening to this poll, are you convinced yet that sexuality is important to talk about no matter how old you are? (laughs) Because I am. (laughs) 76% of people between ages 50 and 80 felt that it was important. And I do too. So... The desire and the interests are there, right? But it is true that the ability to do what we want to do isn't always there. So if you were an acrobatic dominatrix as a 35-year-old, it may be a little harder to do at 75, right? But it doesn't mean people don't try. And it does not mean 
they shouldn't try. It's just that, you know, things may change, but people who we think we are and what we want remain the same, even if our body changes, even if our functional ability changes. So what happens to our bodies, right? What happens on a physiological level or the way in which our bodies and organs work that makes things different? How much do we all actually know about it? (laughs) How much do we want to know about it, (laughs) right? Well, I do. I do. I want to know about it. You know, there's not enough out there in terms of really good research on the topic of sexuality in older age. Not enough, for sure, especially when it pertains to women. But we do know that for a few reasons, both sexes require a lot more stimulation, for example, right? If you ever listen to the iconic Dr. Ruth, who herself is a fabulous 90, um, she suggested at one time that older couples try sitting on a washing machine to see if that did something for them, which I thought was an amazing idea. And actually, Jane Fonda, who plays uh, the kind of businessy woman, Grace, in the Frankie and Grace show I told you about, begins marketing vibrators designed specifically for older women, right? It's a great story arc, and it reflects the need for those things. Now, for men, erections are, I was going to say, tend to be a big deal, but they are a big deal, Um And I I always feel bad because I think the whole manhood erection thing became a bit of a cultural fetish way beyond its importance to fertility, you know. Um, And it's sad because it's true that that it's great if you can have a healthy erection, but it's also true that men can have a fantastic time and still orgasm without having an erection. I know, silence. (laughs) I repeat, an erection is not necessary. You know, that's important in older age. Ejaculation happens with a lot less force. You know, you may not get as erect as you did in younger years, even if you are taking uh, Viagra or Cialis or whatever. But I do get why it is frustrating and embarrassing when it does not happen the way you expect it to. I get it. It's innate to us as a species, and it's how many species procreate. It makes sense. There's a urologist at Johns Hopkins, Dr. Burnett, who is a who studies the nerve regulation that is related to erections and urinary function. And there was an article back in 2012 in which he said the basic biology of erections at the rodent level is the same as in humans, right? So... The important thing to remember here is that our brains and our perceptions differ us from rodents, usually anyways, but that it can be the driving force towards intimacy and affection. So it does matter. So we're not just about our mechanical erections or whatever. We are about our brains and how we feel about that event, how we feel about being intimate and being sexual. There's a lot going on with this area of our lives where our brain is really important. So what about the ladies? Well, you know, for women, and when it comes to physiology, just physiology, vaginal dryness related to the decrease in estrogen and other hormones that occurs with menopause is often a big issue. And this is true also for normal secretions that increase with arousal. These are also less, so you lubricate less. There's less blood flow to these parts. And because of the chemistry of the vagina changing somewhat, the tissue becomes less elastic and more friable, which means it's just more prone to tearing and abrasions. And there can be uncomfortable burning or itching that can occur. And these changes can also make one more prone to getting urinary tract infections, which are more likely by just being female, but it adds to that risk. And because of the changes in that chemistry, it's also easier for certain bacteria to grow, right? And yeah, no, no, that's not the end, ladies. <laughs> I'm sorry. Women are also more prone to incontinence or losing their urine, either with stress, such as coughing or sneezing, or due to weakening of pelvic muscles in general, often due to childbirth that causes urgency when trying to go to the bathroom. Remember those Kegel exercises you often hear about, which means essentially, you know, emptying your bladder, squeezing your pelvic muscles, 
if you ever find them, holding them for five seconds or so, then releasing and doing this 10 times, three times a day and so on. It's a real thing and it's very helpful. And there are some awesome physiotherapists out there who can help you learn this technique if you need it. And it helps. It helps with um, sexual health part of things. But to get back to the actual changes, all of these, you know, the dryness, the burning, the itching, the difficulty with arousal, the maybe worsening incontinence, all those things may even make thinking about sexual intercourse difficult, you know. Although they do now sell those fancy purple underpants that they advertise these days, I'm telling you, (laughs) sexual health of seniors is becoming a moneymaker to people out there. But these things matter. And, And People out there know about this, you know. People who who make products for older adults are quite aware of it. It's a thing. In general, both sexes can have issues with body image, with the adjustment to the physical changes of aging, mobility issues, pain issues, grief and loss that can happen as we get older. These all compound to make thinking about sex or intimacy even less appealing. And it sometimes seems, you know, you don't hear about sexual activity and the changes it causes as being distressing to women as much as men. So you hear a lot about men having an issue with this. But, you know, you tend to hear more about the symptoms of menopause and so on. But there was a study back in 2008 called Preside, which showed that the group that found sexual problems most distressing among women were those between 45 and 64. So... As you're starting to get into that older category, it's a thing with women too. And it can cause just as much concern and emotional distress as it does for men. It's important for both sexes. The thing is, it, it sometimes seems like women don't have as many solutions for the physical symptoms, right? So... You know, there are different type of erectile dysfunction medications out there, Viagra, Cialis, and others. There's injections men can self-administer before intercourse, which doesn't sound nice at all, but it's it's there. It's possible. There are pellets that are inserted into the penis opening that help with, you know, erections. There are penile rings. There are vacuum pumps and implants. And, you know, they have varying degrees of success, but they're out there to be used. For women so far, you know, some of the issues are focused on the vaginal dryness, right? So it can be helped with good lubricants and moisturizers. And there is a difference, right? Moisturizers you use a few times a week. These are things like replens, KY liquid beads, and so on, versus lubricants, which are things that are used right before intercourse. So there is a difference. More significant symptoms can be managed with estrogen creams um, that you put on the skin itself, not with pills necessarily. But, you know, it's always good to talk to your doctor as some women, um, many women actually, really shouldn't be on any estrogen-containing preparations after menopause. It really depends. And there are other preparations, too, that they can use. But this another whole podcast. So if you want to know more, let me know. I will get an expert on this to come in and and give you a little bit more specific info. Now, libido or, or arousal or interest in sex issues, you know, those issues are all about hormones, right? So there's low testosterone concerns, you know, for men, yes, but both men and women. And Lack of libido is often treated with certain antidepressants. And I wanted to take a break here and let you know that it's really important to rule out when you think that there's something going on with your libido, with your, you know, you you were interested in sex and suddenly you're not. It's really important to rule out any organic issues. So thyroid issues, you know, there's other things that can cause this that really need to be treated before you go off looking at, you know, psychotherapy. Okay. And it's really important to remember that many medications can cause loss of desire. So many antidepressants, uh, benzodiazepines like Valium or Ativan can affect desire and libido. Benzos apparently interfere with testosterone production. So that would make sense. 
And then there's medications that can cause problems, but many people don't know about it. So, for example, a line of medications called H2 blockers. Some of them are Zantac, Pepsid, and so on. They're for um, heartburn, essentially. These can lead to loss of libido that is reversible when you stop taking the meds, right? But... The problem becomes, as we get older, that some of these meds are really important to be on. So if you ever suspect that a new med is causing libido issues, don't just stop it, but talk to your doctor. It's really important that they know, understand, and you have a good discussion about pros and cons, right? There was a medication back in, oh, I don't know, 2005, which was supposed to help treat problems with sexual desire in women, but not, I repeat, not postmenopausal women or men. And it has a list of side effects. So I've never seen anyone on this medication because of the population I normally work with. And after reading about it, I probably wouldn't recommend it, but it was out there. And I want you to remember that chronic disease is very important to treat because it can lead to many of the sexual health issues we're talking about today. The most prominent disease for me is diabetes, um, which can cause a lot of blood flow issues. So problems with the vessels, with the vasculature that, that carries blood around, with nerve issues that can significantly affect sexual function, especially in that area of erectile dysfunction. So it's super important to control diabetes, to to prevent diabetes if you can for many reasons. But the sexual health part is definitely there too. So... Are you tired of all these issues yet? (laughs) You know, if this is a little bit boring, I'm sorry, but I thought it was really important to get through this. Um, I would break into song, but you wouldn't want me to, so I won't. (laughs) So, All right. So these are the things physiologically that happen to us as we get older. All this stuff ties in with concerns about sexual activity in older people and the rise of some sexually transmitted diseases in this population. So all this stuff you may have seen about STIs rising and, you know, snowbirds, the people who tend to go to warmer climates for the winter, like to Florida and Arizona, they're seeing a very much higher rates of um, sexually transmitted diseases, including HIV, possibly due to less tendency to practice safe sex for various reasons, right? So, for example, many people, the idea of using a condom, it's still something you use if you want to prevent pregnancy, right? So if you can't get someone pregnant, then what's the point, right? Right? So wrong. So, so wrong. (laughs) Condoms help protect against infection. And that's a huge risk in unprotected sex, no matter what your age is or if you're looking to prevent pregnancy. So some fun facts about this. What does the CDC tell us? So in 2015, 47% of HIV diagnoses were in people over 50. Think about this. And many of these were with late, later stage symptoms, meaning the medications we currently have to control the virus cannot work as well. And these folks aren't being screened. So the guidelines suggest that anyone who's sexually active with a new person or has any risky encounters is screened at least once a year, right, regardless of age. So technically, they say 15 to 65 people should be screened at least once if they're having risky sex or with new partners once a year. But things like syphilis, gonorrhea, chlamydia also have seen increases in the older population. And those having unprotected sex or sex with new or multiple partners should be screened. Problem is, you can't screen if you don't ask or tell. (laughs) Seems simple, right? Remember that Let's Talk About Sex poll out of U of M I was talking about at the beginning? So... In that poll, they found that even though 62% of older people would talk to their doctor about their sexual health if they had issues, only one in six or 17% reported actually talking to their healthcare provider about their sexual health. And if you look at the literature about physicians, very few of them talk to their patients about it 
and they seem to have the same discomfort with asking about it. You know, studies have shown that doctors and some other healthcare providers, like nurse practitioners, have inadequate training in this area of health. I actually looked at reviews of medical education related to sexual health from 1995 to about 2014, and they were essentially the same. The conclusions were the same, that sexual health education for providers is inadequate, that it's inconsistent, and if offered, usually focuses on the plumbing. And one of the reviews from 2014 actually felt that progress in this area has actually gone backwards in the past few years. <laughs> Can you imagine that? How is that possible? You know, the, the truth is that doctors don't bring up sexual health with older patients often enough. It's the section that's so often skipped on those long forms that we do. I've skipped them. I am ashamed to say I have because it's just sometimes too hard to ask about it. There was one study that showed that docs who were more likely to raise this issue with older patients were older themselves, which is interesting. Maybe they were more comfortable, right? Because they knew it was still a thing. Um, and the other type of increased likelihood that they were going to talk to a person about it were the same gender, right? So if your doctor was a female and you were a female, it was more likely the topic was going to be talked about. But overall, docs in most literature show a discomfort with the topic, mostly due to feeling undertrained for this. And one study made me laugh, or the discussion in it made me laugh in both amusement and a little bit of horror because the study authors wrote how physicians made vague references to sexual health, which included statements such as, get this, is everything okay down there? And are you having any vagina problems? <laughs> Dear God, so what can older adults do? What is one to do? Well, I think, number one, you can ask about it yourselves. And if you don't want to deal with a doctor, which you're welcome not to do, um, there are lots of awesome organizations these days that do support sexual health for older adults. There is a great PSA on YouTube. Um, it's not new, but it has like I think over a million views. Um, if you enter Safer Sex for the number four seniors, you will find it. Um, I will include a link on my website. Safer Sex for Seniors also has a very useful website, which, by the way, includes a bill of rights related to sexual health in nursing homes, which is a really interesting read. For lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender folks, there's a wonderful organization called SAGE that advocates for that population. It has great resources as well. And the AARP has some fantastic resources on both sexual health and relationships. It has a whole intimacy section that has some really good articles, including one I recommend on having great sex without having intercourse, which is kind of interesting. And their expert is Dr. Pepper Schwartz, who has her own site, deals with relationships and sex in a really open, accessible manner. It's just great. It's worth looking at. So doctors are not your only source of truth. That's good to know. But people have asked me in the past about Viagra and other pills. But, you know, I kind of always feel like Viagra has become this instant fix to everything that ails older men and, and women and their partners, if that's important to their partners, right? But I always think, you know, Viagra doesn't heal sexual trauma, for example. It doesn't heal broken relationships, right? It doesn't actually improve anyone's desire. It just helps get the mechanics working better again. And sometimes it doesn't, right? Sometimes it has side effects. So, it doesn't really fix everything. Just being able to have an erection is not enough to fix, you know, your, your sexual health issue. And if you can't have physical intercourse or don't want to, which is fine too, you know, it has been shown that intimacy or just plain hugs or holding hands do a lot for a person's sense of vitality and contentment and, and peace of mind. 
if that's the choice you make, or even if it's made for you due to illness, for example, that's totally okay. And you know, barriers are there to be overcome. Many folks who can't do things the usual way due to accidents or genetic issues or progressive disorders who aren't older, they're not seniors, are very familiar with the adjustments you have to make when your body works differently and They're experts at it, really. I actually would love to hear from some of you out there who help teach and assist others that would like to have a better sexual health, but they think they can't, right? Some of the great suggestions I've heard online or heard from friendly occupational therapists, and yes, some occupational therapists are experts at helping you figure out how to have satisfying sex, even with various physical issues, um, suggested taking a warm bath before sex to lessen arthritis or back pain, right? Take it with a partner. Using wedges and pillows to support achy limbs or limbs that were amputated. Uh, doing gentle back exercises to help with back pain before you're going to have sex and so on. Like there's many solutions to these things. Um, you know, one thing I learned, which I didn't know, that there's a wonderful website that deal with ostomy issues. Um, ostomy.org has a great section or, on sexuality. And ostomies are, you know, those holes that are made sort of around your belly area that help with um, when you can't evacuate the normal way, when you can't poop, when you can't pee the normal way, you, you can do it into a bag temporarily or, you know, it kind of depends what your issue is. But those are often... Um, things that people feel very uncomfortable about. And yet this website has some wonderful ideas, including wraps, you know, to wrap that area um, and some thoughts about how unlikely it is to dislodge that with normal sexual activity. It's, It's just a great site. So there is hope and there are ways around a lot of things. So lots of resources, and I can talk for hours, but here it is. Primer on some of the issues we will address in the future related to sexuality and older age, and not just older age, across the lifespan. So I know you can't wait. (laughs) Since I am a lover of quotations, um, I did want to give you one more quote uh, from an article I read in 2018 in the U.S. News Online edition, and I saved it because it was so fantastic. So in this article, Dr. Lisa Granville, who is a professor of geriatrics at Florida State, was relating the story of a bedridden older patient who came into the hospital where she was training staff or residents. And she says in this story, I asked the staff, did you ask him about sexual activity? And they said, Um, no, he's bedridden. How would he do that? She said, I looked at them and said, where do you have sex? Most people have it in a bed. So why would you think being bedridden eliminates it? It's just like Domino's pizza. It can come to you. You don't have to go to it. (laughs) And so she said that her staff clearly decided frailty Being older plus being in a hospital bed equaled no sex. But that's not true. You know, she said, bedbound means already in position and easy to have sex, so change your thoughts. So I loved her practical approach and demonstration that some of the presumptions we make about sexual health as we get older are just that, presumptions. And the truth is that if you want it, you will find a way to get it, regardless of what your state is. Now, it is true that with some of the terrible events in the past past few months um, related to nursing homes and sexual activity um, have changed my sort of mind about, you know, how I see this story. And, and on one hand, it's a story that demonstrates the fact that you shouldn't presume. On the other, it demonstrates the, the vulnerability of people who are bedridden and older or even bedridden and younger um, to, you know, sexual predators. But I think for this particular purpose, for this podcast, I want to use the story to illustrate the fact that we should never assume that someone is not sexually active, no matter what their state. So, The beautiful thing about sex is that the brain has a lot to do with our experience of sexual satisfaction. And that is a good thing as we get older. 
We will talk a little bit more about the intimacy aspect with their relationship and sexual health therapist next week. And I'm really looking forward to that conversation as she's one of the most approachable therapists I have ever met. And I have questions for her. (laughs) So thank you for listening. You know, I hope you learned something. Before I go, remember, I'll post some of the links to the literature I mentioned. And if I miss something, please email me or send a message through Twitter or the website, however you'd like like to do that remember subscribe and review on itunes and let me know if there's anything else that you'd like to hear about the success of this depends on all of you after all seriously and of course stay tuned for part two of sexuality and aging i look forward to uh, talking to you again and till next time dr magda out (laughs) 